Welcome to the latest Salvo podcast. We know the Scottish people are sovereign over any government or parliament because our constitution says so. But what does popular sovereignty or direct democracy look like in practice? Switzerland, a nation of 8.7 million people, has direct democracy. To explain the Swiss model and how it could help us to imagine what a modern Scottish version of popular sovereignty could look like, I'm joined by Henry Ferguson, a native-born Scot who has lived and worked in Switzerland since 1974. Henry's a chartered accountant who spent 25 years with KPMG Switzerland as partner responsible for services to government and to international organizations. For several years, he was in charge of the financial audit for the European Free Trade Association of which Switzerland is a member. A dual UK Swiss citizen, Henry is a strong supporter of Scottish independence. Welcome, Henry. Thanks, Leah. Great to be here. Let me start by asking you about how Swiss popular sovereignty developed. Well, Switzerland was created in a peaceful manner. It started off as a defense alliance between three Swiss German cantons way back in 1291. And one can even visit a museum where the treaty document is ex ex exhibited. You might almost say that this is the Swiss equivalent of the Declaration of Arbroath, I suppose. Gradually, other, can other uh, cantons joined the alliance. There was no conquest worth speaking of. It was rather driven by common interest. The last major coming together was after the Nap Napoleonic Wars in 1815, when Geneva and a small number of independent French-Swiss states joined the alliance. In 1848, 1848, excuse me, the first modern constitution was written and the federal state of Switzerland came into being. This constitution was revised in 1874 and again in 1999. The Swiss people, together with the 26 cantons, formed the Swiss Confederation and the two are joint authors of the current constitution. The preamble in Article 1 of this federal constitution define the federation as being collectively the people and the cantons, but nowhere is it actually stated that the people are sovereign because it doesn't need to. In fact, all politicians refer to the people as the sovereign because in substance they are. People can contest any legislation proposed by the parliament by a referendum, which is a vote to accept or reject the law concerned. They can also propose legislation on virtually any topic under the sun by a pro process called an initiative. And they can even demand a new constitution. In addition, in addition to this federal constitution, each of the 26 cantons have their own constitutions approved by the people and which must be in compliance with the federal constitution. This constitution is all about people power and implicitly consensus. Direct democracy in Switzerland means the people decide everything at all times, not just when elections take place. They hold all the levers of power from E to Z. As a ruling authority, the people have defined the model of governance, seven members of government, and the composition by numbers of representatives by canton, in other words, proportionally. In each of the two chambers of parliament, the people decide in elections every four years, the political party composition of their cantonal representatives in each chamber and thus give their, give their authority to govern, they do not consent to a ruling authority over them, unlike the UK. In other words, at any time, the people can intervene in the national governance process. I believe this is one of the re reasons Switzerland comes out near the top in global well-being and e economic success. Hmm. Well, 750 years ago, while Switzerland was peacefully developing, Scotland was fighting off an English invasion. And since the Union, Scotland's popular sovereignty has been illegally replaced with a restrictive form of English parliamentary sovereignty. 
The people only have a say every five years under an undemocratic first past the post voting system. And here in Scotland, as you know, we're routine, routinely ignored and outvoted. Our MPs are outnumbered nearly 10 to one. That's why we've been forced to live under Westminster governments that we haven't voted for. But Scotland's constitution, which the British state has buried and Salvo is now unearthing, puts the people above any government or parliament. Profiteering used to be illegal. All Scots had a right to a lawyer. And from the year 840, they had the right to a trial by a jury of their peers of seven. There was the Common Good Fund run by the boroughs that funded free education for all. Scots had the right to rebel. They had the right to sack a government, overturn legislation and high court decisions. Are you saying that the Swiss people have those powers today? Leah, that's maybe going a bit far because th things move in a reasonably consensual manner in Switzerland. I'm not sure about high court decisions because there's a very good appeals process. And not, once that's been completed, high court decisions will stick. However, over the four year term of a legislator, if they wanted to, the people could change virtually everything except high court judges and the civil service. Mm. Swiss direct democracy has four guiding principles, chronologically speaking. Firstly, the people control the constitution. 100,000 voters may process a totally new constitution within 18 months from official publication of the initiative. A majority popular vote is required to approve the proposal. Scottish National Congress currently in formation would be the equivalent in Scotland. Second, we have the people and the cantons jointly control changes to the constitution. Once again, 100,000 voters may propose partial changes to the constitution within 18 months. A double majority of people in cantons is required to approve such changes. As yet, as far as I'm aware, there is no Scottish or UK equivalent to a popular initiative or, or also to a double majority system. Now we come to the part that we're all familiar with, Parliament, Swiss Parliament and government draft legislation and decrees. Parliament and government draft laws and decrees to implement, implement approved constitutional changes and other regular government business. This is a normal process except that because the Swiss government and parliament are elected under a system of proportional representation, the legislative process is much more consensual than in either Hollywood, Hollywood or Westminster. And lastly, after the laws have been, have been developed, the people control parliament and government. Only 50,000 voters or any eight cantons can launch a referendum to all proposed legislation or certain government degrees within 100 days from official publication of the enactment. A majority popular vote is required to approve or reject proposals. And this is similar in a way to the one time Scottish salvo, where the Scottish parliament acknowledged the sovereignty of the people, that higher authority by offering salvo at the end of every session meaning anyone could challenge parliamentary legislation that prejudiced their civil rights or freedoms. Lastly, because Swiss sovereign, sovereignty lies with the people, I look on it as a sort of an inverted pyramid compared with the UK. The Swiss government pecking order in terms of power, top of the pyramid, the people. Number two, the cantons. Number three, the parliament, two chambers, chamber of the people and chamber of the cantons, and last, the government. Hmm. Yeah, it really helps to visualize an inverted pyramid with the people once again at the top. And you've said that the Swiss uh, politics are consensual and not conflictual like here in the UK. How is that achieved? Well, in the constitution, there's only seven members of parliament, uh, seven, excuse me, seven members of the government. Mm. 
And that means because the government is elected by the parliament and the parliament is composed by all the political parties act, active in Switzerland, mm -hmm. the parliament is obviously going to elect members to government that re reflect the consensus of the people in terms of political parties. So they've only got six, seven places. They can't go anywhere else. So the seven places are de facto a, a coalition. And that's been the system since 1959. The rotating presidency, because the pr presidency rotates in terms of um, term length of service. So that the uh, the presidency ro rotates, and uh, that assures cross-cultural and cross-political representation at the highest level. This leads to much less parliamentary confrontation, such as Holyrood First Minister's questions, and probably, I, I reckon, would ultimately lead to either the integ integration of minority parties into the government or if such parties don't want to play the consensual game to their elimin elimination from the Scottish political scene. The existence of the optional referendum also has an impact when drawing up a law. MPs strive to find the best possible compromise in order to avoid a popular vote. When the people reject legislation in a referendum, it doesn't mean, necessarily mean that the draft text is buried Rather that, parliament, rather that Parliament and the government may go back to the drawing board and come up with a more acceptable, in other words, consensual decision. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the Swiss politicians have an added incentive, don't they, to get legislation right the first time or the people will intervene. <laughs> that threat is hanging over them. Um, you say the Swiss cantons are also sovereign, meaning the federal government presumably can't trample over them like Westminster tramples over Holyrood. So could you tell us what powers the cantons have? Well, the constitution is very detailed. Um, and in that constitution, it uh, assigns all the specific tasks of the federation. So the competences of the Federation are spelled out in the, con in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. The uh, cantons have uh, all the other powers uh, that, that haven't been assigned to the federal government. The, the Constitution says the cantons are sovereign. So they are federated states and as such have a high degree of independence. Each has its own constitution and parliament, government, police, and courts. Major spending departments are devolved to the cantons. For example, health, education, and direct taxation. No more His Majesty's Revenue and Customs. It's in Switzerland. It's the cantonal tax administration who, who handles your personal taxes. Mm. The Swiss cantons have far more uh, autonomy than 32, the 32 Scottish councils. Uh, I believe the sovereignty of the cantons is actually the glue that holds Switzerland together, subject, of course, to the overriding powers of the people. Any forth my suggestion is that any forthcoming Scottish constitutional conference should make a conscious decision and decide whether or not, as in Switzerland, regional councils are also sovereign. Hmm. That's an interesting suggestion. Yeah, decentralized government is always more effective, I believe, because it's closer to the people. Uh, the Scottish boroughs, for example, had significant power and influence uh, before the Treaty of Union. It would be good to bring a version of them back to an independent Scotland. On the theme of decentralization, I find it interesting that each of the three levels of the Swiss government has tax raising powers. You've alluded to the cantons having tax raising powers. But some may see, uh, say that this is like overly complicated. Um, how does it actually work in practice? Listen, uh, with, with today's level of computerization, it works pretty well, it's surprisingly simple. The Swiss citizens, uh, as you just said, are subject to three legislations, the commune municipality level, the cantonal or regional level, and the federal level. 
uh, political representatives are elected at each level by the appropriate segment of the population, communal, cantonal, or national. And the co assembly concerned has full direct taxation, borrowing and spending powers within its own assigned competence. Tax rates are transparent and fixed by the assembly at the relevant level. Budgets must in principle be balanced. If the electorate doesn't like how the individual politicians have managed the remit at each of the three levels, then the people have enough local information available to assess what's not, what's not working properly and to sack the right people at the next election. Interestingly, the system also favours tax rate competition between the cantons and communes to the benefit of the taxpayer. Try comparing that to the British system of parliamentary representation, and one can see that there's a massive difference between the proximity of the British voter and his or her representative compared with his or her Swiss counterpart. Interesting then, that reinforces the uh, the economic side of it, the tax side of it. In Switzerland, slightly more than half of tax revenues are generated closer to the people at the cantonal and communal level. This ensures there's perfect identity between taxation and political representation. Wow, it sure does. And it also ensures that people know how their tax dollars are being spent, increasing government accountability, uh, which is very, very important. Um, another thing I'd like to take up with you, Henry, is you've referred to the double majority for certain votes. Um, can you please explain what this means and when it, it's applied? Well, when it's applied is um, uh, practically exclusively to constitutional amendments, whether introduced by a popular initi initiative or by the parliament. Uh, these are, uh, constitutional amendments are subject to what's called uh, double majority. This is uh, a double majority of, on the one side, the popular national vote, and the second, the popular cantonal votes. So the number of cantons out of the 26, a majority is uh, 14. Um, and these are the two, the two majorities in the double majority system. I see. And this is, a, is interestingly, is seen as a pretty well essential protection by the minority cantons in the French, Italian and Romance speaking minorities against a German speaking majority of 70% mm -hmm. um, of the population. Depends. That makes me think that depending on how a future independent Scotland were to be constituted, I could imagine such a well imagine such a mechanism being used to protect uh, uh, for example, the Highlands and Islands and or Shet Shetland and Orkney Islands. Huh. Yeah, you know, you're right. If the double majority existed in the UK, Scotland would not have been yanked from the European Union against its will. Uh, we could have actually stopped Brexit. We could also veto free ports, which are no more than giant money laundering centers. And we could ban nuclear weapons from Scotland. Yeah, that's right. Long list of things one could do, especially if one were to introduce the notion of the popular initiative. Referendums are very effective. Referendum, nevertheless, you can't have a referendum until the government legislates. So once the government has produced a law, the people can resist and say, no, I don't like that idea. And they'll call for and launch a referendum. Mm -hmm. However, with a, a, a a popular initiative, it's the people that have the initiative and they can set the political agenda. So in a sense, a, a popular initiative is more powerful than, than a referendum. In any event, the two instruments would, over the long term, in due course, prevent England from dominating Scotland. Yes. Or in an independent Scotland, it would prevent the central belt from, from example, dominating the highlands and islands Absolutely. or the borders. Absolutely. Um, now, you've said the two most important elements of Swiss direct democracy are the initiatives and the referendums. Could you provide a recent example of one? Well, I haven't received the brochure in my, uh, in my letterbox yet, but I've seen it on internet. There's a vote on June the 18th in Switzerland 
federal uh, vote on the 18th of June. And the first subject is uh, climate change. It's a referendum to implement the Paris Agreement on climate targets. The subject first was introduced by an NGO, Swiss uh, Glacier Initiative, against uh, or to initiate uh, measures to stop the glaciers melting. And that uh, the government and the parliament didn't like. They felt the, the initiative went too far. So the country was go intended to be 100% fossil free by 2050. So Parliament approved a counter proposal. And then after that, one of the political parties didn't like that and launched an optional referendum. This being the reason for our vote on the 18th of June. If the par there's still another step, if the Parliament's counter proposal is accepted by the people, then the initi initiative will be with withdrawn. However, if it's defeated, the committee, the original committee back from 2019, the committee still has the right to reactivate the original initiative, giving the people the final say. Direct democracy may be a long process, but it ensures that the majority of the people voting always have the last word. Hmm. Such votes can cost time and money, that's for sure. But at the end of the day, when people in the streets are interviewed on Swiss, Swiss TV or when there are current affairs debates or in the village on TV or in the village hall, it's impressive to see how well informed they are. The, the democracy dividend is, in my view, well worth the effort. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it is. Uh, Swiss direct democracy means the people control the constitution and with the cantons, changes to the constitution, the people can reject government legislation and decrees, and the people ultimately control parliament and the government. They, as you say, they control the political agenda. What a breath of fresh air that is and how wonderful that would be if we could apply that to Scotland. Well, as you know, the aim of Liberation Scotland is to invert the pyramid and put the people back on top like they are in Switzerland. And we'll do that by reclaiming our constitution that still, by the way, has legal effect. It's how we can remove the British state's control over our land, our resources, and our people. In essence, it's how we take back control of our nation. Thank you, Henry. It's been a fascinating discussion, and I hope we can uh, resume it at some point in the future. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.